be available to those who want to use it. Um, that may sound too damn obvious, but actually if you consider the impact of ransomware uh, in the event that they effectively freeze your system, you would not have that availability. Uh, similarly, usability uh, relates to uh, the way this data is structured within your systems so that it is uh, in a format capable of being used for the purposes you want it for. Then we get into slightly less obvious areas. Currency has got to be up to date um, and be clear as to when it uh, pertains to, and it must be complete so that uh, it, you can rely on it as representative of, of everything that you are trying to handle. Otherwise, if you make decisions on incomplete data, your decisions are not going to be as accurate as they should be. Finally, obviously, the dangers of confidentiality, keeping everything safe and secure. We're not just talking about from hackers and the like, we're talking about ensuring that data as a whole, and before we get down to the sub levels required by the different legislation, the data as a whole is controlled and secure so that even inadvertently people cannot damage it. Um, and, and we start getting into the integrity issue in terms of that it does not get changed in any way or, or moved or even destroyed uh, without intent. So these are the key mindset requirements behind data management but with the obvious uh, additional overlay of the fact that there's some legislation that kicks in on this. You've almost certainly heard of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations, um, but you may not be aware that if you pay your staff, which I believe is normal practice in most normal times, you almost certainly, no, not you almost certainly, you absolutely have GDPR obligations. If you take any personal details from anyone, you have GDPR obligations. And as a consequence, you must register with the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, which is the authority in this field, and pay uh, an annual fee. Uh, you can get more details about that um, from that website. Uh, is, there are three tiers and 99% of you will probably fall in the lowest, which is about 40 quid a year. Um, some of you will be paying about 60 quid and maybe one or two will push it up to the third tier, which is about a, over a thousand pounds. So we move forward. You must follow the requirements of GDPR. Well, now that's not really much of a surprise if you are obligated by it. Uh, that means that you must identify your data security risks and assess them after any remedial activity you can put in place and monitor this internally going forwards. Now that's gobbledygook at one level, but what it's saying effectively is understand what your data is, where you hold it, what you could do to improve it, and then make sure that going forward, those risks don't get worse for some reason or other. Uh, let's be very clear, data is much wider than numbers and figures in a computer. Uh, it can be uh, physical documentation. It can be embodied in a human being or a mobile phone in as much as you might have passwords or information about people or projects in your memory or in the mobile phone's memory. And therefore the risk in terms of the data security of any data asset, any asset, whether a person or a system or a thing, like a filing cabinet, um, any data asset holding data must be controlled in some way or another. Obviously that throws up all sorts of requirements and in the scope of this I'm not going to be able to cover all of that but I'm very happy to talk about it at further length later. So when you consider the data that you hold under GDPR you have to have a legal ground for holding it and there are six. Consent, contract, legal obligation, vital interest, public task and legitimate interest. The key ones are going to be consent. In other words, you've actually got the permission of someone to get and hold that data, which you'll almost certainly be familiar with if you've ever gone near the web nowadays, where you're asked 15 times a minute to consent to your data being captured. Uh, contract is where you actually can agree to hold someone's data according to the contract you have with them. And that prevents you having to keep asking them 
Um, but you have to obviously be clear who is asking and who is answering on each occasion. Um, legal obligation, vital interest and public task all relate to different aspects of data that is either held or manipulated or transferred on the basis of a larger public good uh, effectively. So we're talking about things to do with the police, the school system, the health service and so forth. Or in this instance, uh, fighting coronavirus might fall, fall within this. So therefore, the other one you're most interested in is legitimate interest. And that is where you're allowed to hold data, uh, collect it, process it, uh, where it actually is done because your business requires it to operate. Um, there is a little bit of a fine line between legitimate interest versus consent. And that's why a legitimate interest assessment is uh, normally required. Um, you, it will ultimately be checked out, but it's not being much at the moment, uh, to demonstrate why you need this data, what you're going to do with this data, whether it will infringe on the uh, personal and private um, interactions uh, of that individual, and so forth. A case to, in point here, GDPR relates to personal data. Uh, there are other requirements on non-personal, i.e. corporate data, uh, which we'll come on to in a minute. But GDPR relates specifically to personal data. So name, address, age, uh, and then you start getting into slightly more intriguing ones, which probably aren't going to be relevant for what you're doing, but might be. Um, sexuality, political affiliations, uh, their um, education, that sort of thing. So we move forward. Uh, about the legal grounds, you need to be clear on in the case of every single data type, which legal ground you are applying and have the evidence to show that you have considered this properly. Uh, once the data is held, however, whether hard or soft copy, you should recognize that you are required to respond to any requests pertaining to access, in other words, they want a copy of that data, to obstruct it, to stop you uh, using certain parts of it, in, in, in certain areas, restrict it in other areas. There is a difference, but it's quite technical. Dispose of it, in other words, get, it rid, get rid of it from your system, or to transfer it, this is the portability one, uh, from you to another presumably similar uh, operator who might be, almost certainly will be, your competitor. In other words, you transfer the information of, of a particular individual to someone else. Now, Given what FEA do, I don't think that's going to be a regular issue, uh, that portability one, because it's predominantly corporate data that you would be transferring rather than personal. But the fact is there, if you hold personal data, you can be re required to uh, respond to requests for these areas, which you must do within one month, and you may not charge a fee, except under some rather obscure situations. So, uh, yeah things to bear in mind. GDPR puts in place something called privacy by design. It's a requirement that longer term you build your data handling systems and your management systems within your organization so that privacy is maintained the way in, by the way your systems are created. The architecture of the system must demonstrate that privacy will be maintained, that there is a requirement for consent or that there is a requirement to have a legal legitimate interest ground uh, with the backing or supporting uh, written out justifications for why you've gone that route and so forth. You are obliged to report any breaches of data within 72 hours of discovery. It is acknowledged that that's not necessarily 72 hours of when they happened. It is when you discover them. Case in point is the uh, EasyJet release uh, a few days ago. They discovered um, that uh, about four or five months ago they'd had a, a major data breach. Um, the fact that they didn't release that once they had discovered it in April um, is the question that the ICO is going to be following up. Uh, they should have reported it within 72 hours. Their argument was that they um, didn't know the scale of that data breach, and that isn't sufficient at that point. Um, 
You should be aware also that if you have any third party suppliers who have data that you originally collected, so this is outsourced services really, is what you're talking about here, that data is effectively pertaining to your customers and therefore is your responsibility. It is therefore your responsibility to oversee and ensure that those third party suppliers handling and use and disposal of that data is ca uh, carried out responsibly. And uh, the ICO recommends contractual arrangements here to enforce this. This is quite a, a new responsibility and how that's done is not yet totally agreed but certainly a nod in the right direction would go a long way to proving you at least recognize the problem. So in some instances, and this is quite a kicker, in some instances you would have to appoint a data protection officer. This primarily relates to much bigger companies or those in uh, public authority or public bodies, which therefore probably doesn't include you guys. Um, Fun and games with a data protection officer is they come with several other rules, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, firstly, we're going to have a look at something called the PECR obligations. This is the Privacy and Electronic Communications regs. Uh, now, these are actually um, something that were put in place uh, by uh, the EU um, as a uh, a regulation and therefore have been incorporated into the uh, UK law already. GDPR was put in place as a directive, I believe it was, and consequently had to be embodied in UK law. It does mean that um, between the two of them, uh, you know, in theory, there's, there's one that might disappear when Brexit comes around, but we are uh, assured that that won't happen and it will all get incorporated into UK law by then. However, what this relates to is some of the corporate information. It relates to emails and electronic marketing and communication for all organisations. Uh, some public bodies are covered for wider issues like traffic monitoring, which obviously isn't going to affect you. There is an overlap, uh, but obviously corporate information is not included. Uh, however, you must comply under PCR uh, under all circumstances. So they cannot ask you to not comply, sorry, to, to um, avoid your responsibilities. So the clear, uh, the point about that is that uh, when you use data for marketing, um, here we go, when you use data for marketing purposes and you collect it for marketing purposes, you have to be very clear how you're doing it uh, and that you keep records of why you are doing it and so forth. Very like GDPR in that regard, but it is wider than the private uh, requirements. So whose data is this? Because you're happily thinking, well, this is data we've collected, it's what we are responsible for, uh, and we will um, therefore have the responsibility. Well, everyone, of course, has the right to expect that you will look after their details. And the point here to remember is that if, that, uh, if you have a situation that your personal data was distributed uh, around the world or destroyed when you didn't want it to be, you have, a, um, I suspect, a major issue. Uh, and therefore, why would you have any... Um, have any diff you, you would find it very difficult to disagree with anyone else whose data was lost um, by you perhaps. So it's best to start with the idea that data belongs to the person or organization to which it relates. That may not be the legal interpretation of who owns the data until you lose it, at which point they don't care. The courts don't care. You lost it. It was your responsibility to look after it. So disabuse yourself of the idea that it belongs to me, therefore it doesn't matter what happens. Um, hopefully that wasn't there anyway, but there we go. So what's the implication of a breach of data? The most significant and indeed, frankly, the only relevant one, and this might be strange given the scale of the fines that have been touted, but the only relevant one is reputation loss and for a very simple reason. However big the fine, reputation loss will bankrupt your business far faster than any, any authority can apply that fine. The fine is potentially into millions. 
But if your business has stopped functioning, it doesn't matter. You will not be there. Your customers are going to react immediately. They hear that you have managed to lose data about them. They're going to be very, very unhappy and they are probably going to leave in droves. They may not. And there's no doubt that some organizations like EasyJet, um, who have had a number of breaches in the past, um, TSB, I believe is another one. Uh, they, they, you know, they're still there. But there's no doubt they've taken a big hit. It will drag the business down far faster than any criminal sentences that may apply um, can ever be uh, implemented for the very simple reason that the criminal process will take several months, in fact, probably over a year, whereas the business will react within probably 24 hours of the news being made public. The adverse impact overall, therefore, is it going to be far faster than any reaction by the authorities. It will also be slow, potentially impossible to rebuild, even if you had the chance. In other words, reputation loss is way out of proportion and far faster than any impact caused by uh, legal or fines or, or criminal issues. And therefore, the issue you need to, to have foremost in your mind from a data breach concern is the loss of reputation. So now we start moving forward to look at the data focus um, in terms of FEA member types. Now I was looking on your website and there are four member type versions uh, laid out and we'll take them all one by one. Um, but before we do that, let's just have a look at why this matters because obviously the controls being operated in each case are going to be slightly different. Uh, you're going to have data that's on and off site. So you may hold data in your organization, but of course, if you've got any people who have access to that data and they go off site with or without taking that data with them, but if they can have access to it off site, it can disappear off site as well. Uh, and obviously that needs to be controlled. Then you've got the issue of Internet of Things and various data recording devices. Uh, some of these will be maintained on site, some will be maintained off site. Some of them will go direct to cloud, some will go direct to servers or to computers, or it will be maintained on the device itself. All of this will need to be controlled. Then there's what we are calling regular and irregular activity. If this is something which is done on a regular basis, then the methodology for controlling that data, handling the uh, way that it is processed, ensuring that it is checked in terms of the legal uh, obligations on it, can all be laid out in, in solid procedures and followed relatively easily. Where that sort of thing is a one-off or an occasional project, then it's obviously very important to make sure that uh, for that project, the data is handled properly. Then there's internal and outsourced data flows coming into your organization. So your data flows that you have generated versus and how you handle them versus data flows that other people have generated and how you handle them. Uh, because obviously if for some reason or other you are effectively a third party outsourced organization, uh, thinking perhaps of, of um, people who, who uh, carry out roles for you, but may do the same for other organizations, you wouldn't be particularly amused to find that they had managed to uh, switch the data flows between you. And so you suddenly saw all the other organizations data. Uh, and obviously there's a differential scale for different data sets. So what you do and how you handle data pertaining to customers versus staff versus suppliers is going to be different. Firstly, you want it to be different. How you market to suppliers or communicate with suppliers is going to be different to how you market or communicate with staff and similarly with customers. Staff, you're definitely going to have GDPR related personal details. Customers, you may have some personal details, but you're likely to have some corporate details and suppliers the same. So obviously making sure you apply the appropriate controls in each case is quite important. Um, obviously, uh, controls are needed 
uh, for all data types under each of those parameters. So this is quite a comprehensive review required. So let's have a look at business services. So these would be members who provide business services to the FEA focused industries. So they're providing support services, uh, typically outsourced, uh, not core necessarily. Uh, they often visit sites and then carry off, off other activities off site. And they probably are very specific in the area that they focus on. So if we start to look at the impact, they will have access to some or all data streams on that site. And therefore, uh, they need to have data controls that pertain to both of those, namely the access on and off site, uh, how it's collected. Uh, they may be using data recorders, which could be, I don't know, um, uh, readers of some description or calibration devices or, or ID um, verification devices, um, internal reports that are made from the data and therefore potential to have it circulated both in inside your organization as the business service organization or within the customer's organization. And then there'll be staff controls, your staff controls when they are off-site on the client side or on your side. And obviously the impact of that with regard to data controls when it's held and operated and manipulated on or off-site. And obviously any individuals who are outsourced in this instance, so the individuals who are going to visit the, uh, the, the client um, will fall under GDPR in terms of their information. So scheduling information, for example, names and addresses, contacts, and so forth. So those are the different data types and consequently the actions that need to be taken to address those will vary depending on those different types. Then we get to servicing organizations. Now these are the organizations, they are almost certainly regular contracts with their clients. Occasionally they're one off in the event of a problem or something. They do do a variety of different tasks on site, but they're obviously also visiting quite a lot of different sites as well. They have a flexibility focus, in other words, it moves around. Uh, they're not there all the time, and therefore they're both on and off site, and they will be doing work off site as well. And again, you get the general issues now. You see how I'm, I'm looking at this. The data concern may not be the first thing they're focusing on. What they're focusing on is making sure that the item that they're servicing is working. Uh, and therefore, you may have issues getting people to focus on this. Um, there will be instruments which are reading data flows. Now, as such, that's almost certainly going to be uh, corporate related data flows, you know, how many meters per second or, or volume or whatever, and not GDPR focused data flows. So you need to be clear which data is within GDPR, which data is within PECR, so that you can apply the correct controls. Then you've got manufacturing. So if you're a manufacturer, you're probably doing fairly regular tasks, making the same thing day after day. Uh, your focus is going to be on the volume and quality. Uh, you probably have the same workforce. It's not varying very much and they've been at it and considering normal times, not under COVID, but we'll have to work with that as well. Um, you, who you can therefore get a good grip on in terms of training and so forth. And you may have some outsourced supply especially for components and things like that. With the obvious corollaries, you will have key data on materials and usage, etc. Most of that will not be GDPR related, uh, but the handling of that by individuals will be GDPR potentially. Uh, obviously, you can give clear instructions because you've got a constant workforce. The issues, of course, are that, well, this is the way we've always done it, or yeah, well, I know, but this is Fred's way of doing it. He's always done it that way. Or John's the boss and he wants to do it his way so no one can tell him otherwise. That won't cut it if you're handling data flows which fall within PCR or GDPR. Obviously, there's an issue regarding outsourced data flows. As soon as you outsource supply like that, there will be uh, data going outside the organization. Again, you need to be clear whether it's GDPR related or not. If it is, then you need to have some controls on it and obviously to do with staff on and off site. 
and finally the distributor stroke dealers. They're proffering a specific brand or brands to a large selection of customers. Their focus is selling, potentially even with an international outreach. So what we've got here is the fact that they're going to be dealing with a, a range of different data sets, large volume of customer data, potentially quite large number of customers, which falls under GDPR uh, if they're individuals. And uh, there could be quite a high proportion of financial data as well. Uh, and they will be interacting if they go across uh, national borders with different legislation uh, because this was embodied as a regulation, sorry, as a directive, the, um, the, well, where is the directive? Each individual EU state puts it into their own version of the legislation. Where the original European legislation was a regulation, it goes directly into that nation's um, legislature as written by the EU. Uh, and therefore, in some instances, you're going to have different legislation in, in different EU countries. In other cases, you're going to have the same. And then, of course, if you're outside of the EU, um, then it gets a bit more complicated again. And obviously, any individuals who are working for you are going to be focused on making the sales, uh, and they need to make sure that making the sales while controlling data is also uh, an important consideration. So, Along with that, you obviously have internal issues which are common for all types. So when you're dealing with data input, whether it's scanning or via an Internet of Things device through an upload or an internal systems transfer, whether it's to do with recording via a computer, server, mobile, portable device, hard copy, processing by staff, computer or external, storage, cloud server, and especially where it's located nowadays, it's getting more and more tricky to control. And then issues of how you share an authorised data, who is allowed to, how it's done, what permissions have to be given. And ultimately, how long you keep data for, when it's deleted. There was a sort of feeling that, well, we can keep it forever because we've got the space, but it's no longer going to be quite the same. You're not going to be able to keep stuff for longer than you can justify, and therefore you'll need to recall why you're keeping it. Again, I'm relating to GDPR and PECR related data. It falls within their definitions. You will need cookies. Uh, this falls under PECR uh, and the ability to recontact people. Um, so data monitoring, what is happening, why it's happening, what effects and controls become quite crucial. Um, and the point, and just finish off on that, the point with these last two is, is yes, they're predominantly PECR, but that applies to all organizations and relates to corporate requirements as well. Consequently, you need to be very careful with uh, how you ensure you've got the permission and how you can uh, demonstrate that you are following the permissions that you have got, because there are a number of options that are in place. Some cookies, for example, um, you are allowed to have um, because it's, it's a requirement for the business. A classic one might relate to what an organization has in its shopping trolley when you go to pay. So you've gone from one website to another, from your website perhaps, to um, the uh, PayPal or, or whatever financial website, and that cookie carrying that information across in terms of the, the sum needs to go across, and you can't, that's not something that people can refuse to sign for. Uh, other cookies uh, relating to whether people can be recontacted or where tracking where they visited and things like that. Some of those will need permissions. Is a better idea what I'm talking about. So how can we deal with this? Well, obviously there are things you can do internally. Uh, you'll be quite relieved to hear that there are a number of things that people have thought of already. Um, the simplest and possibly one you've heard of is something called Cyber Essentials. It's a government scheme and uh, it was put forward, but it's very simple. Then the next one is something called the ISO 27001 Data Security Standard. Uh, you've probably heard of the Quality Standard 9001 and various other ones. This is a data security standard. Uh, and it is focused on data security as a concept rather than GDPR. There is a specific add-on, you still need to have 27001, 
and you can get 27701 as an add-on to that. Now, obviously, if you get that put in place by your own in-house team, that's going to be much cheaper uh, than um, doing so in a different way. It'll also be more effective um, because you can carry out that externally as well. It, there's a grounds to believe it will be more effective as well because it means that the knowledge of how the system works and what's gone in will be far closer to what really is happening and consequently uh, more accurate and therefore more reliable. Uh, there's a bit of a grey area in the middle uh, where you have it installed and maintained in-house but you have consultants to advise to improve perhaps from time to time. There is one more level that we'll talk about which is Cyber Essentials Plus which goes into a bit more detail. I'll talk about those now a bit more. So the first one was the Cyber Essentials, government led. It requires that you do five things. At one level this looks extremely simple and very obvious and certainly if you've managed to do these five things you are pretty much in charge. The problem is that's it. It doesn't tell you how that is done uh, and consequently you may know how to secure your internet connection and make sure other people don't get in there. Uh, secure your devices and software, well some of that's physical security, doors and locks and things, some of them are password controls for the virtual security. Um, but controlling access to your data and services is such a wide ranging subject, you know, what is your data, where is it, what's it mean, what justification have you got for having it and so forth. And then you get on to the other areas. So there's a lot that is hidden behind those five areas. There is an external cost if you want that to be um, assessed externally uh, of 300 pounds. Uh, but you are going to get far more of that, sorry, far more than that uh, to make those changes if you haven't done much in the past. So it's very practical, it's very necessary and it's very good as far as it goes. But what's happened is that people have recognised that while that's great, it's very sort of basic level instruction. And consequently, something like the 27,001 standard uh, with the add-on as necessary uh, is actually giving you a lot more information. So 27,001 is a full standard. It has about 100 preset controls, and slightly more at the moment, but it's just about to be reduced, um, to slightly less than 100. Uh, with additional procedures required. In other words, these controls are listed there and for each data item, you need to ensure that every relevant one of those controls is applied and is in place. There are, is a current version from 2013, it's been amended in 2017 uh, and this mental approach in terms of the ongoing amendments is, is continuing and there will probably be another one in, in the next year or two, I should think. Uh, it looks at the entire physical and virtual requirements to control data uh, within your organisation. And it does that by creating what's called an ISMS, an Information Services Management System, which is an overarching, uh, nearly autonomous approach to controlling that data, nearly because you will need input. Uh, to demonstrate that this has some uh, validity, uh, you might be interested to know that the ICO is using this particular standard and has determined that they want to install that for their own data security. So they, they rate it. Uh, you can get third party certification. You do not have to. Uh, it really depends on your mindset. Uh, plus it costs more to do so. As mentioned, 27701 is an add-on. You need 27001 first. It adds effectively the additional GDPR variants of data security. You remember, it requires that you keep various bits of data safe. That's the data security bit. But it also requires that you um, answer various controls, uh, various requests for information by uh, anyone who contacts you, uh, obviously clients whose information you hold. And if you wanted to have a, a structure for that, then that's where the uh, 27701 comes in because it gives information and 
controls on how to respond to, record, and adjust your responses to the various requests that you get. Uh, now, 27701 has only just been released effectively, and it's not yet clear how it will be assessed, either in terms of the third party certification, nor with regard to how the ICO will look at it and how it's going to react. So, uh, a lot of people, should we say, are holding off to see what the first pronouncements are by certifiers and, and the authorities as to how, how well this handles things and, as a consequence, what needs to change. Ultimately, it is designed so that it becomes as close to getting compliance certificate for GDPR as you can be. I don't think it's there yet. It's a damn good step in the right direction. But ultimately, it's going to depend how it's imp implemented anyway. So then we come down to, is it better to install and maintain and create, obviously, these systems in-house or out, out of house? If you do it in-house, the knowledge is held by you anyway, and therefore you don't need to worry about transferring that knowledge to the consultant. You can do it at your pace, uh, and it will obviously match exactly what your organization does because you're not interested in trying to make it a generic fit for multiple different types of organization. In terms of the actual cash, there will be a much lower cost, but uh, from about £1,200 a year, it's possible, uh, plus certification if you want. I say lower cash costs, so you should be aware, of course, that um, it will take time to install. Uh, it's a fairly, not tedious, but lengthy and not inspiring, so perhaps tedious is more appropriate, a uh, process to go through all the data sets. But once done, then that process is, doesn't have to be repeated often. It needs to be reviewed from time to time, but that main process is, is probably in line with what you are comfortable with going forward. So from that end of the scale, you move to the outsourced approach, i.e. using consultants. Now, they're going to be very familiar with the standards, which you may not be. Um, and they will be familiar with your, your organizational type, perhaps, um, probably in a more generic sense, so not necessarily within the FEA area, but in, you know, they know what a dealer or a broker or a manufacturer or, or service organization would do generally, uh, and how the data security standard applies to them. They will want to work faster because you want to, won't want to pay them to work slowly so it will happen more quickly uh, but it will as a result uh, still demand time from your staff to help tell the consultants exactly what it is you do and how you do it and how you want to get this done it will cost considerably more as a result this is a totally individual organization by organization based decision uh, but it's good to know that there is an option then you have Cyber Essentials Plus. This is effectively, officially, Cyber Essentials with penetration tests. The interesting thing about Cyber Essentials, which if you remember is those five areas, by the time you've done all of those properly, you've effectively done what the ISO standards require you to do anyway. So by this stage, once you add penetration tests, which ISO doesn't require, this becomes something slightly more. A penetration test is where the, um, your systems are effectively hacked by someone who is doing it as a friendly action uh, to, to see how robust they are. Now, we are talking, of course, both virtual and physical systems. So this can involve uh, people. So they might you know, whoever's doing these penetration tests might be sending phishing emails to see if your staff open them. They might be asking by telephone, which by the way is perfectly acceptable. You can receive a request under GDPR in any format whatsoever. It can be as a tweet, it can be as a telephone message, a fax message, it can be by written letter, it can be by email. All of these need to be answered. If you do not answer, you are in breach of the legislation. Um, and therefore your staff will need to know about it. And consequently, if they answer the phone request for uh, information under GDPR, uh, they have to be very clear that the right people are asking for it. 
you can't have someone's phoning and saying, well, my name's Fred. I want the details of my, that you hold about my wife, Mary. Now, I appreciate that example doesn't really apply to the FEA, but you can see the logic behind it. You could have a spouse phoning up to say, my husband works for you. I want to know um, details that you hold on his salary and so forth. Um, and the answer is no, you can't, because that's an inappropriate request. Uh, it, that is individual to that, in, to that specific person and is not, however justifiably, uh, something that can be asked for by the spouse. Um, imagine a scenario where she's thinking of going for a divorce and wants to know what she might get, etc. So you don't want to get involved in that, but it does mean that your staff must know when they can effectively refuse a request as well as when they should answer it. And this is the sort of thing that penetration tests can pick out. Uh, now that sort of testing obviously has to be repeated on an ongoing but not necessarily continuous basis to be any benefit. So that's an ongoing cost. But you can see that by this stage you're really beginning to have a system that you can rely on and uh, look down at and, and think, yep, we really got some of this have sorted. Uh, certification costs for that are about £1,500 plus VAT, but that doesn't include the cost of actually doing the penetration tests, which you can see could be quite considerable. So we're nearly at the end now. Just a, a little note here. I am very happy to uh, distribute, or I believe the FEA will distribute on my behalf, copies of this uh, presentation. Uh, so this is where you can get more information. The ICO website is extremely useful. Uh, their website is there, as is the National Cyber Security Centre. But the ICO one is, is probably the one you want best. It's got a very good guide on GDPR and PECR. Uh, and um, you can go directly to it just there. There are a range of different tools that relate to this um, and uh, funnily enough we can help you get these, we can provide the consultants you may need, uh, we can also source getting your data that's currently on the dark web uh, and find out whether it's there or not, uh, that bit we do for free, uh, getting it off the dark web I'm afraid we had to charge for. Uh, we can provide someone who's um, a lawyer in GDPR legal advice um, who uh, has specialized in this field since it came out uh, or uh, various forms of IT monitoring services and penetration tests and so forth. Uh, what we also provide is a form, the, the automated I ISMS version, the in-house version that you can run at £1,200 a year. So if you want to know more about what we can provide, please look at the uh, addresses uh, or contact me and I now throw the floor open for any further questions. Okay. Over to you, Keith. All right. Well, firstly, Carl, thank you very much for uh, such a concise uh, presentation, but also for a very, a very clear and effective uh, delivery. If I can ask any, anybody who has any questions, if they can uh, uh, put those into the uh, chat. Uh, but just while we're seeing what we might get in there, Carl, can I just ask a question? Uh, and I recognise it's fairly broad, but what are the, the common issues that you come across um, within businesses? Because we've, we've seen a lot of work described there that, that's needed and some companies may be at different stages in the processes. But if there is a, an opportunity to generalise, what are the common weak points perhaps that, that companies should look to address first? I think the, the most important thing is to embark on the process of identifying what data you hold. Mm. Uh, this is for a number of different reasons. In the longer term, it's so you don't miss anything out. That's vital. Uh, and, and that you've correctly characterized what sort of data it is, whether it's GDPR, whether it's PECR, whether it's simply your own data and therefore within your own remit and so forth. Um, but the other benefit, and this is the good news, everyone, is that once you've begun that exercise and have evidence that you have begun it, you are going to be in a far better position if anything goes wrong, because you have very clear evidence that you are taking this legislation seriously. And consequently, if something does go wrong, you aren't just saying, oh, I didn't know, but you're saying, well, we did know, but we haven't quite got there. We're working as fast as we can, which will gain you a lot more acceptance by the authorities. As you may remember from the WE legislation when that came out, when it first came out, no one had a clue what was to happen. 
And the same sort of approach was adopted, as was, by the way, the same for the packaging regulations, the batteries regulations, and a number of other legislation, which is totally new in character. There is the way the, the authorities deal with that is they recognize that they cannot simply enforce 100% overnight. Mm. It'll take time for people to take it on board. So the more you can sh demonstrate that you are taking it seriously, the more leeway you'll get if something goes wrong. So that's the first step. Make sure you've made a start. That doesn't mean and then stop, but it does mean that it's a very necessary first step. You've got to know what data you've got and what type of data it is and what it constitutes. Once you are there or getting that going, the next thing I would do while that is being completed, perhaps, is to make sure you know what you would do if there was a data breach. Now that process will develop as you reform your understanding of what data you have, but to have no idea what to do next, even to the extent of who to contact for help, uh, is obviously a, a, a bad state to be in. So those would be the two first action areas, um, ideally run in parallel, to be honest. Um, and the second one with regard to the, the reaction to a data breach, the sooner you get some sort of idea of what you would do, the more comfortable you're going to feel about it. Mm. Uh, and again, the more comfortable the authorities will be that you've actually taken on board your responsibilities here. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, I'll just uh, read through one of the questions we've got here. I don't know, can, can you see the question, Carl? Uh, um, I work from home and uh, like many are having to do so now from a, a personal point of view, um, and listening to Carl, uh, somebody took a comprehensive review of their home information, and they're now using a password manager. Uh, the question is, um, what security system might be best to use to home use best to use at home in general, um, such as McAfee or I guess um, other service providers? Um, what's the best to use in terms of that, and also a malware system? For, protection. Is there any indication you can give us there? Not, not directly, I'm afraid. Um, the, the, the intricacies at that level, we've got a number of consultants who can certainly help with that and I'd happily uh, put you in touch with them, Malcolm. Um, it's not something we charge for, that's not the issue, it's, it's simply that I'm not the best person to give that sort of specific advice, I'm sorry. Um, but we have people who can or I can point you in, in various directions. Uh, so, uh, if it's okay, Malcolm, I'll um, contact you through Keith if need be, or, or please feel free to contact me yourself and we'll see what we can find for you. And, and thank you for that. And uh, yes, we'll make the, the slides available and the recording of this webinar will be posted on our website with Carl's permission. We check that Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and, uh, yeah. okay. and I really ask uh, anybody who'd like to take this forward to get in touch with Carl directly. We'll, we'll post the details around. Um, and there's significant knowledge and expertise in his, his own professional area, but uh, also we have the benefit of Carl having an intricate understanding of, of our sector of the industry, which will undoubtedly bring, bring benefits in the depth of uh, knowledge and skills and service that he can provide. Um, we don't have any other questions, Carl, so I propose we, we bring this uh, to a close. Um, just again, a thank you for your time and for the presentation this morning. Thank you for also, the opportunity. That's a pleasure. My thanks to Jocelyn for arranging uh, the webinar for us. And just to say um, to all concerned, keep your eye on the emails that we're putting out, also on the social media threads um, that are going out. The, the, the whole of the FEA team are focused very much on helping us through, let's say, the strategic, tactical and the operational needs that you have. Um, but as members, if there are any issues that uh, you need us to address, please don't hesitate to talk to any of the team and make that representation because we're keen to act on that and deliver back to you exactly the service you need um, for, for the, the current time and also in the future. So just a final thank you to all, you all for joining us and uh, I wish you well for the rest of the day. Thank you all very much. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.